These days, the conspiracy theory factory is large and self-sustaining. For those of us who like to question beyond the mainstream media spoon-fed narrative, this is a good thing. Of course, certain of those among us will get stuck over in the deep end of the conspiracy whirlpool, but that doesn't rob those of us with more sober minds of our legitimate concerns and doubts. Take 9-11, for example. Conspiracies from all ends of the spectrum surround the events of 9-11, but you don't have to think that the whole event was set up by the Bush administration to know that something fishy was going on in the back halls of power. Why is that? Well, take, for example, the recently released 28 pages, redacted until just this year and now available to the public. Among other things, the 28 pages, pages seem to suggest suspicious Saudi royal family links to some of the hijackers. Recently, Sean Stone sat down with the founder of whowhatwhy.org, an expert on 9-11, Russ Baker. Sean first asked him if the CIA was also on the trail of the hijackers and how the 28 pages relates to that agency's operations back in the early 2000s. Let's take a listen. Uh, my sense after years of following this story and after our site, Who, What, Why, breaking another piece of it about the uh, Sarasota, Florida connection, again, to the Saudi royal family with the hijackers. Um, I think there are layers and layers and layers of this thing. It's very, very complicated. And I do think that there is a larger uh, game in play that will explain why the U.S. government is so determined that we not understand the full scope of what took place. Absolutely. But let's start with what has been divulged with the 28 pages. Uh, obviously, there's, it focuses only on the San Diego side and San Diego cell of the hijackers. It doesn't get into um, Florida and other locations. But what do we now know that we did not know before those 28 pages were declassified? Well, I mean, some of this had already been out a bit. What's interesting, I mean, here's the basic background, if I may quickly sketch it. You, you had a uh, congressional inquiry uh, uh, following the 9-11 attacks. You also had the so-called official 9-11 inquiry. The congressional inquiry is the one we're talking about. They produced a report. About 28 pages of that report were entirely redacted, and those pages dealt with information that the panel saw relating to connections between the Saudi royal family and the hijackers uh, via some individuals, two in particular who you mentioned, uh, who are uh, ba uh, Bayoumi and Basnan, who are, uh, appear to have been some kind of Saudi intelligence officers. So that's that report. There was a second report, the so-called official 9-11 report, uh, which supposedly references some of the same material, uh, but did not get anywhere as far in terms of talking about the Saudi connection. Over the years, uh, the, uh, the congressional inquiry had been prevented from releasing those 28 pages, and former Senator Bob Graham, the, who had been the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, has for years been pushing for those pages to be released. And uh, uh, finally, we saw several weeks ago the release of these documents. What's interesting is they released them on a Friday, of course, when everybody was heading off on their holiday break. And as many, many other stories were coming out, uh, it did not get the kind of attention that it warranted. And what's so astonishing about those 28 pages, and by the way, Sean, as you pointed out, even those now released 28 pages were still redacted further. If you look at it, you'll see big sections blotted out. Now, on our site, Who, What, Why, you can go there, read an article about this, and we have links so you can see the redactions. But in any case, even with those redactions, you can see very clearly that the commission was under the impression that these two individuals were, in fact, Saudi intelligence officers. They had direct con connections to several of the 9-11 hijackers, principally uh, the first two to arrive in the United States, in one case actually picking uh, him or them up at the airport, getting them situated with housing, supplying them with funds and other logistical support. Now, also very, very significantly, uh, Prince Bandar, who was the Saudi ambassador to the United States under George W. Bush, 
uh, was very close with the Bush family, so close that Barbara Bush dubbed him Bandar Bush. And there's that famous photo of uh, him and George W. Bush sitting on a balcony of the White House smoking cigars together, extremely close, that Bandar Bush and his wife personally provided financial support to the hijackers uh, uh, via this San Diego operation that you're talking about. So this is, of course, there's no way around it, but this is one of the most profound uh, uh, discoveries uh, on one of the most profound news events of the last century or so. Uh, and it appears that the Saudi royal family, one of the US's most steadfast and most important allies, uh, may have funded and aided and perhaps even planned the attack on the United States at 9-11. And so, of course, this is enormously important. Now, what you're raising, I think, very correctly, is this other issue that Richard Clark is putting into play, that maybe there was more to this story, because if, in fact, the Saudis were behind this, how come the U.S. didn't go after them and this never came out? Uh, what we see continuously is cover-ups by the Justice Department, by the CIA, by the FBI, by the State Department. What are they covering up? And I'm hoping that today you and I can talk a little bit about that. That, oh, the possibility that, like a lot of intelligence operations, there were multiple layers and there were perhaps cells and uh, uh, efforts going on that other people were not aware of, where you had people actually trying to ride this operation to see where it was going, well, I suppose, with the idea of stopping it. And then you have to ask yourself, well, if they had that information, why didn't they stop it? Right. So. Obviously, you mentioned Bandar providing uh, financing to these hijackers, well, future hijackers at the time, but they were known as al-Qaeda operatives at that point. And in and, and Richard Clark's uh, article, the counterterrorism czar points out that uh, because this, there's a relationship between a Saudi official, al-Bayoumi, and these um, al-Qaeda operatives, he believes that there could have been a CIA element actually monitoring this, and that's why the CIA did not alert the FBI of the presence of al-Qaeda operatives inside the United States. So is that, do you believe this is a credible explanation? I do. I, I have, have always suspected that there was more going on here. And of course, uh, what we don't see very often in the media is a sophisticated analysis of the rivalries between these different agencies, their failures to cooperate, which are always chalked up to, you know, sort of archaic computer systems or something, but it's nothing of the sort. They're really just rivals. Both of these agencies are extremely opaque. We know really very little about what they do and why and who really makes the strategic decisions within them. Uh, and, and I don't doubt at all that uh, that elements within the CIA are certainly have the sophistication to monitor these people. It seems almost impossible that uh, al-Bayoumi and Basnan could have been in the, entered the United States and did what they did and interacted with the individuals they did. And as you point out, having the uh, al-Qaeda ties, having the ties and the interactions with key people within the Saudi royal family, within the, uh, they were uh, in contact with the uh, Saudi embassy, uh, consulates, and consulates and so forth. All of these entities are constantly being monitored. And so it seems almost impossible that the CIA would not have known that something was afoot. Now, if we go and we look at Florida, uh, where we see uh, other members of the 9-11 terrorist cell, we again see them interacting with all kinds of people. We see pretty good evidence that CIA was aware of this. The uh, airfield near Sarasota, where a number of them trained, uh, this family that we wrote about at Who, What, Why, uh, this family in Sarasota, that owned a, a home in an affluent, gated community there. Uh, the man who owned the home was the CEO of a company whose chairman was the head of uh, Saudi aviation. And his father, the father of the man who owned this company, has since 9-11 become the king of Saudi Arabia. So what you're looking at is the family of the people who actually run the country right now in direct contact with these uh, hijackers. You see CIA all over it. You see uh, possibly CIA gun, uh, uh, drug uh, operations and uh, weapons operations running out of these same airfields in South Florida. So I think this is a story that is going to keep on giving. It's a big, big story that begins 
to allow us to get a glimpse into what you might call the shadow government, this, this wholly unaccountable entity within our own uh, government that I think the president, frankly, understands almost nothing about.